But that's not the only reason. Jesus' accusation was not just that he was a king with a kingdom and he decided, decided who entered. It was Jesus was a king with a kingdom who decided the conduct of those who would enter. And we're pretty good about going to heaven when we die. That seems to be the pitch, right? You want to go to heaven when you die? Come on here, let's handle this little thing. You talk to Jesus. Have a little talk with you. Whatever that means. I had a little talk with a man upstairs. You've never had a talk with Jesus that flippant that ever accomplished a thing. He's not your homeboy and he doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. This is a Jesus who said things and it got him killed. Not did things, said things. No one wanted to kill a Jesus who was healing sick people. They wanted to kill a Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is a Jesus who does not mix well and mingle well, but after all, that's why you're here this morning, because you love a Jesus that your world doesn't love. They love the Jesus that feeds the hungry. They don't love the Jesus that says, you're not at an advantage here because you're religious. He determines our conduct. And so our king in his kingdom determines that those who will be a part of his kingdom cannot be rebellious. He has commands for those who will be a part of his kingdom. Yes or no? It's quiet in here, Rick. I think it's just you and me. And sometimes Dot. Your king is not someone that just you meet at the door and say trick or treat and he dumps your bag full of candy. Your king is someone that requires certain things from us. We have to know right now, we have to know right now that our king requires things from us. But my king wouldn't do that. We're not talking about your king. We're talking about the king that was nailed to the cross for being a king. Well, my Jesus, we're not talking about your Jesus. We're talking about the one on the pages of this book. And he requires things from us. And let me just say this. He does not allow reservedness or reserved being reserved in his kingdom. Now, I know that we do. I know that we're okay with that. I know that we tell people, oh, it's okay. Just take what you need from the Lord. Uh, he's the cosmic bellhop and you're the needy person. Don't worry about a thing. Whenever you need him, ring your little bell. He'll come carry your bags to your room for you. And then when you don't need him anymore, put him back in the closet where he doesn't bother you about your immorality. That's not the king that was nailed to the cross. The king that was nailed to the cross was the one who, yes, forgave a woman after dismissing her accusers and then said to her, see that you do not sin anymore. Brothers and sisters, that is what gets a king nailed to a cross. Not just that he accused, he was healing and feeding. It was because he was a king that requires a lot from this world. So, we're about to take part in the king's table. And I just need you to know, it is not for you if you're a rebel to the king. This table doesn't belong to you or me. It belongs to the king. I suppose the other thing that really got on their nerves was that their king divided their reward according to their labor. Now, I don't know how that all works, but he gives reward, we're told in the previous chapter that we looked at last week, about how he said you get kingdoms and houses and lands and brothers and sisters a hundredfold, and that just really annoys people. <laughs> it really does. You know, when you're standing in front of someone and they think you're for sale and they just wave cash in front of you, and Jesus says, I'm not for sale. I came to bring a cross, and if you're here to follow me, then you have a cross to carry as well. I don't understand everything about my king, but I do know that he got nailed to a piece of wood for being a king, not for being a good teacher, not for being a good healer, for being a king. A king who decides what happens and how it goes and what needs to happen, that's our king. So now we dine at the king's table. Those of us who have found forgiveness from the king. We have found a free pardon of sin. We have been rescued from a treasonous lifestyle. Not because we're good boys and girls, but because our God is very good. 
He has a son who is a king, and he is reconciling the world to himself through the blood of his cross. That is our God. He wants no one in this room to leave a rebel. He wants no one in this room to leave a rebel and to live a life of selfishness. Our king is a gracious king, and his father is a good God. And so we honor him as king. He is our joy. As we dance in his streets, we do it to his music. As we work in his vineyard, we do it at his cadence. His songs are our songs. We wear his apparel and we trust in his goodness. Does that sound like, listen now, does that sound like your life? Or is this something you have to try to do on Sundays? Do you have a different speak at the job? Do you have a different priority for your money? Do you have a different way of pleasing yourself? And church is something you're just kind of like doing because it's what you've always done. And mama up in heaven would be so ashamed of you if you weren't in church on Sunday. Or do you really believe that you have a king? Because here's the deal. Jesus was guilty of being a king. Rightfully accused of being a king. Totally guilty of being a king. That is our Lord, and he is our king. And if he's our king today, and if he was our king when he died on the cross for our sins, then as we take this bread and the fruit of the vine, we are declaring that not only did he die a pauper's death, not only did he live a servant's life, both of which he did on our behalf because he did not have sin of his own, we are also saying that he will return, and he will please the Father, and he was raised the third day, and he did please his Father in his life and death, and he is interceding for us right now to return for his own, to establish his throne on the earth, and then it will be very clear to everyone that he is king. 2 Timothy 4, 1 says, I charge thee before God who will judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Here's what will happen when Jesus returns. He's bringing a kingdom. 2 Timothy 4, 1 is one of many passages. We pray for it in our Lord's Prayer. Many of you came from very liturgical backgrounds. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is what we've prayed for years and years and generations and generations to what end? Because our ultimate hope, our ultimate desire is that he reigns on earth and brings a kingdom. He is reigning now. 1 Corinthians 15 says he will reign at the right hand of the Father until he's put all things in subjection under his feet. Everything is being subdued little by little through the preaching of the gospel and it's living out through those recipients like you and I in our neighborhoods and in our workplaces. God is winning over the world and subjecting his enemies if you believe 1 Corinthians 15. And I guess what I'm trying to say is Jesus was a king and he is a king. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The, the world and those who dwell therein at Psalm 24, 1, it's the Lord's. And towards the end of that psalm, we have the psalmist saying, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, for the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. So he was the King, he is the King, and of course you know he will be King. Revelation 19 says that he is the king even now and he is going to be and will be known as the king of kings. You see, Calvary is just a, just a, glan a glance, a glimpse of what we will see one day. When Jesus returns, he won't be nailed to a piece of wood. He will rule the entire world with a rod of iron. That is our Jesus. Oh, listen, we need to keep finding this King Jesus. This is the Jesus who, while he was dying on a cross, was upholding all things by the word of his power. Hebrews 1.3 says that when he had by himself purged our sins, he was upholding all things by the word of his power. Think about while his hands are being nailed to a piece of wood, his own divine will keeps all things spinning on their orbits. That's your God. That's my God. That's our King, brothers and sisters. Colossians 1.18, he upholds all things. All things are created by him and for him. And by him, all things consist. The reason why we have molecular bond at the physical level, at the, at, the, uh, at the microbial level, no, smaller, at the atomic, at the quark level. I mean, as small as you can get, the reason it's not flying apart is because Jesus is holding it together. He is the king. And, and so, how, how's a good way to end this conversation? 
I would say probably you would look at verse number 31. Uh, rather, verse 28, the scripture is fulfilled, which says he was numbered with the transgressors. And, and this is the great exchange. This is the great exchange. And, and Andrew, I know he's, he had to go to work this morning. Where's Dana sitting? I, have, I about dropped my black licorice hard candy out of my mouth in small group this morning. I love black licorice, just so you know. I have two pieces of it right here. It about fell out of my mouth this morning when you went to 2 Samuel, because right here in my very notes, I have a note about 2 Samuel chapter 9. We're dealing with King Jesus, who is looking like a sinner. Brothers and sisters, as you approach those three crosses, we have criminal, criminal, criminal. Guilty, guilty, guilty. Guilty of insurrection, guilty of murder, guilty of being a king. Three criminals. He's numbered among the transgressors. This is a quote from Isaiah 53. He looks just like a criminal. He dies just like a criminal. He dies in the place of criminals. He died in the place, literally, of a criminal named Barabbas. And he dies, no doubt, prophetically, in the place of this criminal, Bill Stern. I'm neither rich, I am poor in spirit, or I don't go into the kingdom. I am not adult, I must be childlike, or I don't go into the kingdom. I must be accused of being able to take up the cross, or I don't look like I belong in the kingdom. And it is all by grace, through grace, through faith in Jesus. And I'm so thankful that the man who hung in the middle was guilty of being a king. Because at this table, right here in front of us, we have the Lord's Supper. It is the king's table. And in 2 Samuel chapter number 9, we have a man named Mephibosheth that was, blind, that was lame on his feet from being dropped as a child. He was paralyzed. And it's said in 2 Samuel chapter number 9, after he was rescued from Lodibar, he was brought to the king's house, sat at the king's table. And the beautiful thing about being at the king's table as a lame man is that no one can see your legs. You look just as healthy as all the other king's sons. You look just as healthy as the king at the head of the table, King David. You look just as healthy as all of the real royal people. You're not royal. You had to be adopted into the family. You're not well. You had to be made to look well at the king's table. And today, dear brothers and sisters, because we have a king who is numbered with the transgressors, you and I, who are part of his kingdom, can belly up to his table and be counted as one of the king's sons. And daughters. And for that we are grateful. My Lord. I pray that you would be with each person in this room today. Who has not yet put their faith in the shed blood of Jesus. That they would do that. I pray that they will be counted today as one of the king's, ch king's children, king's sons, king's daughters, one who belongs at the table, being counted among the king's seed. I pray that you put their confidence not in baptism and certainly not in this juice or this wafer, but that they would put their confidence in the man in the middle who is guilty of being a king. I pray that you be glorified in this Lord's Supper. I pray that you would help each participant in this Lord's Supper to take worthily. I pray that there's one in here that's been following from a distance that they will not bravely and obstinately take part at the king's table. I pray that if they've been making uh, trivial the things of God, that they would not unworthily take of this table. I pray that you'd help us, O oh God, to renew our love for the crucified and risen Christ who is counted among the transgressors. We're so thankful, Lord, that you told us in 1 Corinthians 11 that we should do this Lord's Supper until you return. I pray that you'd help us to take great joy today and that our King is alive and that he has brought us to his table. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll have a song, the deacons will prepare the, the Lord's table, and then you will be served. And I want to ask everyone in this room, prepare your hearts as it's coming. If you feel you'd like to sing, feel free to sing. May the Lord bless this Lord's Supper.
Jesus Messiah. Name of all names. Blessed Redeemer. Emmanuel. The rescue. I just, I'm so thankful for gifted songwriters that know how to put sermons in three or four minute blocks. Praise the Lord. The king, the night before his crucifixion, his execution, sat with his cabinet. As they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup.
Brother Walter, would you stand and thank the Lord for the bread and ask his blessing on the cup? forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again
Thank you for letting me be your pastor. One of my great joys is to just stare at you while you're singing. It is completely unmanly to sing unless you have a real reason to do so. Some of you men, you found a reason. We serve a great king. And there was a day when men knew that they followed a king and he deserved to be sung to. And our wives, they sing a whole lot easier when we're singing. Our children feel like they have a license to sing, especially the boys, if they look and see dad doing it. Let's give the world a license again to sing to a king. He took the cup. And when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. And all at the king's table said, Amen. The passage closes with, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Let's stand together and sing a hymn. Body. 
Hallelujah. Tonight, part three at five o'clock of uh, Brother Walter's Bible study in the fellowship hall. Of course, choir practice at 445. And then in here at six o'clock, we'll have our evening worship. We'll be bringing a message from the book of Ruth, chapter one, on when you think you need a hero. That's the title of the chapter. And I'm not the hero, so you'll have to come and hear who it is. Brother Randy, would you close us in prayer? Father, we just thank you for this day, and we just thank you what's taking place here this morning amongst your people. Lord, we just sometimes have a hard time understanding everything that was done on the cross, but we know you are a king, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords. Amen. Take us away from here today and keep us safe. Bring us back tonight at the appointed time. We thank you, Lord, for loving us and meeting our needs in so many ways. And Jesus, we just thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.